Good afternoon. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the 29th annual edition of the Estoril Political Forum. It gives me great joy to announce a recorded message from His Excellency, the President of the Portuguese Republic, Professor Manu uh, Marcel Rebelo de Sousa. Duas curtas palavras em português para saudar e agradecer na pessoa da Sra. Reitora da Universidade Católica Portuguesa e do Sr. Diretor do Instituto de Estudos Políticos a incansável experiência, que é anual, de sucessão de uma iniciativa cheia de prestígio, com nomes altamente qualificados, oradores, comentadores, responsáveis pela moderação, que prestigiam a academia, prestigiam a ciência, prestigiam a, a apreciação de natureza histórica, como natureza politológica, como de natureza sociológica, que imprime o cunho da excelência àquilo que é já uma realidade de que não prescindimos na sociedade portuguesa. Excellencies, dear students, Dear friends, in a complex and difficult time of multipolarism without multilateralism, dangerous erosion of democracies, limited initial response of international organizations and states to the pandemic crisis, a symmetric recovery of econo economies and societies, and also recent internal different approaches and embarrassing, not to say the least, fallout of Afghanistan with insufficient dialogue amongst allies, we must be able to understand that the free world must send a strong and clear message. In NATO, in the European Union, in any other democratic and free world organization. First, a strong and clear message of cohesion, unity, solidarity, based on our values, freedom and democracy. Freedom and democracy need and deserve it, the world needs it. Second, a strong and clear message on the parameters to continue to address the challenges posed by a more assertive Russian Federation, and I know you're going to examine this issue namely in energy, particularly gas, cyber, and political issues. In the Euro-Atlantic, but also in the Euro-African areas. Reality imposes it. Present balance of powers advises it. Third, a strong and clear message on the active perception of the new threats of terrorism to international peace and stability, with direct and indirect effects in Euro-Atlantic geostrategic space. Any stable international order makes it an unavoidable priority. And uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, leaving human rights at stake and uncertainty uh, situations behind, could upgrade this priority. Fourth, a strong and clear message on a renewed challenge called China another issue you're going to debate, defining fields of dissent, fields of competition, and fields of selective dialogue and engagement. Future, and who knows how rapid the bipolarization inside the multipolarism calls for it. Fifth, a strong and clear message of recognition of the vital role of all our Partners, free world partners, reconciling regional vocation of some organizations like NATO with surroundings and neighborhoods, and also with the global focus, including the whole world. This is true 
for instance, in case of NATO, in the western north and eastern flanks, as it is more and more in the southern flank. Sahel, Central Africa, are the vulnerable and stateless territories. This meaning Africa, earlier than Latin America or even Asia, now in the future being an epicenter of Islamic terrorism with Russian Federation back there. Excellencies, dear students and friends, let me add two key ideas connected with the so much needed first message, cohesion, unity and solidarity. First, about the relationship between NATO and the European Union. Europe and the United States have worked side by side in the stability of the liberal order, in the successful expansion of democracies, in regulating economic and technological globalization, and in managing the international peace and security environment. And even with ups and downs in the climate issue. The success of this alliance over the last uh, seven decades can be measured by the economic and social development of its people, the consolidation of their democratic systems, the empowerment of multilateral organizations, the strengthened institutional dynamics which are resistant to more aggressive shocks and competition. This means we have successfully resisted all these while enabling the formation and enlargement of the European Union itself. We must not forget it. We owe a lot in the free world to this unique alliance. United States and Europe. We owe a lot specifically to NATO when speaking of European Union. So there is no reason why we should be tempted to weaken this transatlantic link when what really matters is to strengthen it, reinventing answers to new common problems, not mistaking arrogance for power, nor illusory self-sufficiency for aspiration of regional autonomy or need of a strong European pillar. Improving our information and our forecasting capacity, in particular where we have intervened and have intervened for a long time, like Af Afghanistan. Realigning positions when some try to divide us and bringing institutions closer to citizens. And this is where my comment is directly concerned with another issue you're going to examine in these uh, debates. And this is the second key idea. I look at the free world, including NATO, European Union and other free world organizations, democratic organizations, not only as solid military and political alliances, but also as consistent pluralist security communities in our living memory. And this political ideological dimension largely explains the durability of the Atlantic Alliance, for instance, of the alliance between the United States and Canada and uh, Europe, and the phases of reconfiguration through which we have been going. The truth of the matter is that we, allies in this fight for the free world, together with other partners, have been able to build similar political systems, being drivers of deeper and more enduring rapprochement based on mutual trust and on internal political and economic procedures with which we identify. We are linked by a we feeling, 
a sense of solidarity and collective identity. That's the free world. And uh, this is the reason why, for instance, NATO was able to incorporate both democracies with solid, long-lasting parliaments and new democracies while solidifying the foundations of those same domestic political systems. But, and here we come to your third issue, be aware if political systems, as it is already happening, are not nurtured and adjusted to the new challenges, or they do not address inequality, lack of economic and social cohesion, they become obsolete and leave voids where radicalism or anti-system populism can naturally enter. And they are there, visible. Sometimes with the so-called illiberal democratic messages that are not at all democratic. Or simply the distancing of people, their selfishness, their xenophobia, their indifference. A new free world alliance, however strong it may be, can succeed without the support of its people and strong political systems. So, I, I end where I began, thanking the Portuguese Catholic University and the Institute where Professor João Carlos Espada received and receives and renews year after year the message of Churchill, the message of the free world. I send you my message this time of gratitude for your work because it is important for university, it's important for this young student down there, but it is also very important for Portugal. I will now give the floor to the rector of the Catholic University of Portugal, Professor Isabel Capua Gil. Senhor Diretor do IEP, Professor João Carlos Espada, Doutora Rita Brito, caros palestrantes, caros professores, estudantes do IEP e de outras universidades, é com particular alegria que hoje, 17 meses após um dos eventos mais inesperados do nosso tempo, vejo esta sala do, Estoril, do Hotel Estoril Palace cheia de participantes neste importante Fórum Global que o Instituto de Estudos Políticos da Universidade Católica Portuguesa vem organizando há três décadas. Aqui sente-se de forma real e perceptível a energia que antecede os grandes debates. Porque, na verdade, a Universidade é isso mesmo. Um santuário do debate livre e da perspectiva plural que, nas condições de hoje, antecipa o amanhã, pensando estrategicamente o desenvolvimento da sociedade e capacitando os profissionais do futuro. É por isso relevante que após a suspensão do tempo se relance o amanhã e que este projeto se faça de forma comparada, porque nenhuma nação existe isolada, nem mesmo as insulares, e que se passa também de perspectivas distintas. O Instituto de Estudos Políticos da Universidade Católica Portuguesa afirmou-se de forma sustentada como Honest Broker do Pensamento Democrático em Portugal e quero uh, cumprimentar e agradecer ao professor João Carlos Espada, ao seu diretor, o trabalho notável que tem feito ao longo de quase três décadas de Instituto, certamente três décadas de Estoril Political Forum. É... E enquanto dizia Honest Broker do Pensamento Democrático em Portugal, tem lançado o debate 
formando cidadãos capazes de pensar estratégica e responsavelmente o futuro. Estratégia e responsabilidade são duas palavras cruciais nesta equação. São elas, na verdade, que orientam a formação que é dada na UCP, na Universidade Católica. E são elas também a exigir as alianças que, perante os perigos para o exercício da democracia no tempo presente, serão determinantes para a subsistência daquele que é o pior dos regimes, à exceção de todos os outros. Dear participants of the Historial Political Forum, distinguished guests, dear students, I'm delighted to welcome you once again to the Estoril Political Forum and to this extraordinary venue in Estoril. To welcome you in presence, that is. Because if we think where we are, then certainly the inspirational place where this high-level event of Catholica's Institute of Political Studies takes place, the Estoril Palace Hotel, is a harbinger of um, defining events in 20th and I would say also 21st century politics. Um, so the place where we are cannot be simply substituted by a remote streaming event. And as this year's forum topic is structuring a new alliance of democracies on occasion of the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter, it is important to be inspired by the larger alliance setting and think as well and practice the smaller alliances of academic exchange using this event to widen and enrich the eclectic networks that are crucial to the development of knowledge and to the practice of politics. And alliances allow us as well to consider, project and shape a more perfect future, especially in the face of adversity. NATO, the European Union as well, which can be also called an alliance of nations, naturally, rose out of the rubble of conflict and dissent, and they shall always be incomplete, because that is the very nature of democratic alliances, that they're always in the making and striving for more perfection. American philosopher Martha Nussbaum famously claimed that in order to thrive, democracies need to cater to a strong economy and a flourishing business culture, armed by a robust military establishment, but that it is also required for democracy to live on, to cultivate the imagination. It is, she argues, the ability to imagine that comes forward in art, literature, film, the performance arts, that keeps democracies alive and awake. This imaginative capability prompts the exercise of critical thinking and reflection which is crucial to allow democracies to deal responsibly with the many problems of our world. I shall end my brief reflections thus by inviting you to consider precisely the work of the imagination in building ever more perfect futures. And if there are film buffs here, I'm just going to tell you in advance, spoiler alert ahead. Yesterday, I watched with a sign of dismay I may add, the final James Bond movie, 007, No Time to Die. The 25th film of the Bond saga, No Time to Die, is, as all other Bond movies before, a comment on our times. The plot is, as always, framed by the sense of imminent threat to the world, saved in a last-ditch effort by the efficient, though unorthodox, actions of the MI6 agent James Bond. The recurring storyline ends with the demise of the villain, of course, and his or her network, Spectre, and the reinstating of order. The viewer is reassured that in the end, Bond, and hence the MI6, will prevail, meaning that democracy and the rule of law, though it is questionable that at times Bond follows the rule of law, but don't forget that. Um, so the viewer is reassured that democracy and the rule of law shall always succeed over authoritarianism and repression. Well, that is till now. If anything, Bond has become more humane in the last films of the saga and in no time to die in order to save his most cherished secret, and as I said, spoiler alert, a daughter, he's hopelessly poisoned by the villain, Safin, in such a way that though the poison will not harm him, it will kill anyone he touches. With no future in sight, that is a future, a future based on human interaction, he self-sacrifices to save humanity. Bond dies, well. Surely there'll be another 007, but not Bond. And why does Hollywood kill Bond? Well, 
maybe because our times have no need for an unorthodox dapper hero that dresses up in a tuxedo, hobnobbing with glamorous lady agents while he proceeds to kill evildoers in style. A hero that despises animals. You may remember that it is the villain that cherishes cats and dogs and things like that, so it's not really Bond, so he's against all this friendliness towards animals. So a hero that despises animals, drinks on duty, etc., etc., etc. Perhaps Bond's death is testament to an era that is undergoing transformation and signals a watershed moment. It imagines, in fact, a point of transition for democratic Western societies. The saga, too, adapts to the changing needs of society. Viewers no longer look for lone heroes, but require robust and long-lasting solutions for a very fragile world. And this is arguably what democracy is all about, a regime that listens to different voices, that favors equality before the law and liberty of choice, seeking to sustain a decent life across the many divisions that any society entails, and allowing its constituents to, ima to imagine a better future for all. My hope is that in our different functions, we shall all do our bit and that this forum continues to shine as a beacon of hope for ever more perfect coalitions of the willing. Thank you and have a great forum. It is now my pleasure to give the floor to the director of the Institute for Political Studies of the Catholic University of Portugal, Professor João Carlos Espada. Senhora Reitora da Universidade Católica Portuguesa, Professora Isabel Capelo Gil, Senhora Diretora do Estúdio Político Fórum, Professora Rita Seabra Brito, Senhores Embaixadores, distintos convidados, Senhoras e Senhores, caros alunos, caros amigos, gostaria de começar por agradecer a presença de todos nesta 29ª edição do Estúdio Político Fórum. Um agradecimento muito especial e muito enfático, como todos seguramente partilharão, é devido à Sua Excelência o Presidente da República, pela sua tão amável, tocante e inspiradora mensagem, bem como à Senhora Reitora, pelas suas palavras tão amáveis e inspiradoras também, e pela sua presença tão simpática e amável e importante para nós. Muito obrigado por estar connosco. Pedia agora a vossa compreensão para usar a língua inglesa de forma a poder comunicar diretamente com todos os nossos convidados estrangeiros. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome at the 29th International Annual Meeting in Political Studies, now also called, as you know, the Estoril Political Forum. We are delighted to let you know that you are participating at Portugal's largest annual meeting in political studies. And yes, indeed, almost 29 years have now passed since we had our first meeting in the Arabida Convent in October 1993. We were then no more than 20 participants. I'm told that we now have around 600 in-person registered, not to mention those who are attending online. I'm also delighted to let you know that we are now starting the celebration of the 25th anniversary of our Institute for Political Studies, which was launched in the academic year of 1996-1997. A full celebration is being prepared for the next Estoril Political Forum, by the way, the 30th, 3-0, hopefully in June 2022. In the, mean, in the meantime, though, we expect to be able to circulate a sort of preliminary version of our booklet about the 25th anniversary during our present meeting. This will be only a preliminary version, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, circulate it uh, during our conference these three days. And then the full celebration will take place on the, in June next year. And speaking about our meeting this year, the title, as we all know, is on the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter, Structuring a New Alliance of Democracies. And this title will certainly, surely, 
not surprise the friends of the Estoril Political Forum, as President Marcel de Rebelo de Sousa has so kindly and aligned in his very touching opening message, and as our rector has also kindly underlined, if there has been a defining permanent feature of our meeting since 1993, this has certainly been our strong commitment to liberal democracy, the rule of law, free trade, and a market economy, the common ground of the Atlantic Charter of 1941, as well as of NATO and of the European Union. This common ground, incidentally, is also one of the distinctive features of the hotel where we are meeting, as the, our rector also kindly recalled. The Estoril Palace Hotel was the hotel of the Anglo-American allies during the Second World War, and it was also the birthplace of Ian Fleming's James Bond, about whom our rector has spoken so kindly. This common ground is, of course, epitomized by the patron of our Estoril political forum since the very beginning, Winston Churchill, as President Marcel Rebelo de Sousa has also very kindly emphasized and recalled. Ladies and gentlemen, precisely because we share this common ground of liberal democracy that Winston Churchill epitomized in the 20th century, precisely because of this common ground, we are happy and delighted to have always had with us speakers and participants with different political dispositions. We have conservatives, Christian Democrats, liberals, libertarians, social democrats, and democratic socialists. And on the very crucial topic of the European Union, we have federalists and anti-federalists, Europhiles and Eurosceptics, Remainers and Brexiteers. We have never asked for conformity of views in our previous 28 international meetings in political studies, and we are certainly not asking for conformity in this 29th meeting either. On the contrary, we have always encouraged critical controversy between rival, different and even rival views, provided, of course, they share the common ground of defending the free world. But we have always requested a gentle respect for general rules of good conduct. This is what we teach our students every single day, precisely because we don't like to do as we are told by central powers, precisely because of this allergy of ours against central commands, we are seriously committed to abiding by general and impersonal rules of good conduct as opposed to arbitrary specific commands from above. One of these rules, by the way, is punctuality. We try to start on time and we try to end on time. And we like to call these general rules, rules of gentlemanship. These are very old fashioned, very old fashioned rules that were not centrally designed. They have gradually evolved through interaction. And precisely because they were not designed by a central power, they are far apart from the unfortunate tribal habits that now tend to dominate or at least infiltrate some universities and some television channels, as well as the so-called social media, of which, of the latter, social media, as I have said in previous uh, studio meetings, I am glad I know nothing directly. Uh, I don't use them, and um, only having been told about them by very kind and helpful friends. So some people may um, ask the postmodern question, how do you define gentlemanship? Since I'm talking about rules of gentlemanship, some people could ask the postmodern question, how do you define gentlemanship? And I, as, as I also have said in previous meetings in Estoril, I'm glad to respond to that question with Karl Popper's definition, which he taught me more than 30 years ago. And I quote from Karl Popper, gentlemen, do not take themselves too seriously, but are prepared to take their duties very seriously, especially when most around them talk only about their rights." End quote. In the good old days, people used to call this civility, and civility was, of course, a general disposition that applied to women as well as men, who were then called, if and only if they behaved properly, Ladies and gentlemen. So, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, 
I am delighted to let you know that we have made available to all participants of this Estoril political forum a copy of the memorable Atlantic Charter signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill on August 14, 1941, when they met at sea in Placentia Bay, Newfoundland. We will certainly be discussing the significance of this Atlantic Charter, especially, I'm sure, its present-day significance throughout our Estoril political forum. For the time being, I just would like to recall a brief uh, quote from uh, Churchill, how Churchill described this Atlantic Charter in the third of his six-volume book on the Second World War. And by the way, the third volume, incidentally, was titled uh, The Grand Alliance. And I quote from Churchill, the profound and far-reaching importance of this joint declaration was apparent. The fact alone of the United States, still technically neutral, joining with a belligerent power, Britain, in making such a declaration was astonishing. The inclusion in it of a reference to, quote, the final destruction of the Nazi tyranny, end quote, amounted to a challenge which in ordinary times would have implied warlike action. Finally, not the least striking feature was the realism of the last paragraph where there was a bold and plain intimation that after the war, the United States would join us in policing the world until the establishment of a better order." End quote. You can find the, the copy of the declaration in the corridor and I think in this room too. Um, and if you can't find it, please be, feel free to ask us and we'll be delighted to give you a copy. The Atlantic Charter was indeed <clears throat> a, what, a watershed moment in the Second World War. It was a tremendous commitment to liberal democracy in a time when tyranny seemed to be unbeatable. A new Atlantic Charter, incidentally, was recently signed by President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Boris Johnson, also by the sea, at the G7 summit in Cornwall, Britain, on 10 June this year. We are also making available a copy of this text of the new Atlantic Charter and very much looking forward to your insights on the significance of this new joint declaration in the context of the new global challenges to liberal democracy. I'm also delighted to recall that we are also making uh, available to our guests another famous speech in defense of liberal democracy, when liberal democracy again was endangered, endangered in this case by the communist threat. Um, and I'm referring to President Ronald Reagan's Westminster speech in 1982 to the British Parliament, when he famously announced his commitment to the global campaign for democracy. So the, this, this uh, copy is also available. Thus, that speech led to the creation of the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy in late 1983. We have the rare privilege and pleasure of having with us, during this uh, Estoril Political Forum, the founding president of NED, our very good friend Carl Gershman, who will certainly recall that speech tomorrow at the George Washington Memorial Dinner together with Mark Plotner, founding editor of the journal, journal of Democracy, who gives us the privilege and pleasure of, ser of serving as the chairman of the International Advisory Board of our Institute for Political Studies. Both of them, incidentally, will participate in our very next panel at 4 or 4.15, I think, on the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter, structuring a new alliance of democracies together with the director of our Institute European Studies Center, José Manuel Barroso, and with the director for Spain and Portugal of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, our friend William Hofmeister, as well as our friend Amikai Megan from IDC in Israel, who will join us by Zoom from Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope, I really hope you will enjoy our meeting and it is now my pleasure 
and privilege to give the floor to the very distinguished director of our Estoril Political Forum, Professor Rita Siabra Brito. Thank you very much indeed. Muito obrigada, professor João Carlos Espada. Muito obrigada, senhora reitora, professora Isabel Capelogil, pela sua presença e pelas suas palavras que tanto nos honram. Unfortunately, uh, the mayor of Cascais, Dr. Manuel Carreiras, Dr. Carlos Carreiras, peço desculpa, is unable to attend this opening session because he is at the inauguration, or he will be at the inauguration, the ceremony of the mayor of Lisbon. I would only like to add that after so many months of uncertainty, I am delighted that we were able to gather so many of us at this beautiful site in Estoril that has become the home of this forum. I also take this moment to greet all those abroad who are joining us virtually. The atmosphere of ordered, orderly liberty, which we celebrate in these meetings, touches those who visit us and reflects in the success of this unplanned evolution of what has become a great institution of Friends of Liberty. It is for me a great privilege to be part of this enriching forum. Please note that the conference program is available to you both in paper at the reception desk and online in the conference website. Thank you all for being part. We will now take a short break and we'll resume back here uh, at 4.15 for the next session. Thank you.